we've been talking about bonding, and in the previous chapter, we looked at ionic compounds, and ionic compounds are formed through a transfer of electrons. In this chapter, we've been talking about covalent compounds, and covalent compounds are formed through a sharing of electrons. Last time, we learned how to draw the compounds, everything fitting into our learning goal. Today, the main question we want to address is how chemists determine the molecular geometry and polarity of covalent compounds. So once we've drawn the compounds, we want to look at their shapes and polarities. And you'll be looking at this in the lab today. You'll be constructing the compounds, and you'll truly see the five different shapes that we're going to introduce here. In order to be absolutely stellar, we're talking A+. Plus. You need to be able to draw structural formulas for compounds as well as isomers, and most of you feel pretty comfortable with that after last time, and that will be assessed on your quiz next Wednesday. For some reason, some of you thought we were having a quiz this week, so I was getting so many texts, I just put a blast out that we were not having one, so you wouldn't stress over it. Today, we're going to look at shape and polarity. We'll be constructing the compounds using molecular model kits in the lab. On Monday, we're going to name and write chemical formulas for covalent compounds, and we'll also then really delve into that project that we're looking at for the second nine weeks. To really, really, really master these concepts, you'll need to compare and contrast with ionic compounds, and can you explain everything to a classmate, and that's why you're paired today and you'll be paired on Monday. You still can earn an A, but you're more in the three-point range if you're unable to explain to a partner. This is a very bright class. I feel very confident you'll all be there. And then, like I said, a very bright class, so I don't foresee anybody falling into the lower range. But if you're there initially, we'll do everything we can to get you up, up, up. We finished off drawing compounds last time Resonance structures and drawing compounds or drawing um, structures for polyatomic ions is very, very tricky. I can show you that separately at the end if you're interested. Our focus today is going to be on shape and polarity. We're going to do shape first. At first glance, it's going to look very tricky, but I promise when I draw a crazy structure up here, you'll be able to determine every shape with ease if you follow the steps that I show you. Shape and polarity are both very important in determining properties of molecules, and that's why we need to be able to determine shape or geometry and polarity. To determine shape or geometry, we're going to use a theory known as VESPER, valence shell electron pair repulsion. This allows us to predict the shape or geometry based on how many atoms are attached to the central atom and how many lone pairs are on the central atom. For example, let's say that I drew this compound, carbon dioxide. And we'll talk about why I put those lone pairs of electrons at the corners in just a second. The way we go about this is we look at the central atom and we ask how many atoms are attached directly to the central atom. One, two. So in parentheses first I write two. That's how many atoms are attached directly to the central atom. Then we ask ourselves, how many lone pairs are on the central atom? None. You'll see where this is going in just a few minutes. Let's say, for example, that I had a water molecule. You've seen water molecules in science textbooks for years, and it's often drawn in this fashion. How many atoms are attached to the oxygen? Two. Two. How many lone pairs are on the oxygen? 
two. And if you can do that, you'll be golden and I'll show you where all of this leads. And this is for CO2, and this is for water. What Vesper says is that electron pairs, these can be bonding pairs, or they can be lone pairs, orient themselves as far apart as possible to minimize repulsion. And that's why when I draw these, I've got the lone pairs in the corners because that positions the electron pairs as far apart as possible to minimize repulsion. Now you don't have to draw these perfectly like this. You could have two dots there and two dots there or two dots there and two dots there. But the structures you'll see in textbooks will look like this with the lone pairs and the bonding pairs positioned as far apart as possible. When you want to solve molecular shape, your approach is to first draw the structural formula or the Lewis dot structure for the compound. And that's why we went over drawing previously. Now these drawings are gonna be pretty easy. Then you'll use the chart to determine geometry. Now you'll use the chart initially, but you won't be given the chart for keeps on quizzes and tests. The kids did ask if I would spell out the shapes for them, and that's fine. I can do that. Some of them are a bit much to spell, and I get all kinds of weird things if I don't provide them, and I'm fine with that. There are five shapes. Linear, bent or angular, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal pyramidal. In a linear shape, there are two atoms bonded directly to the central atom. There are no lone pairs on the central atom and the bond angle is 180 degrees. Two examples are given there. I'm gonna do CO2 first because that's the one we drew. And what you can see here is the carbon is bonded to two atoms no lone pairs on the carbon. This bond angle is 180 degrees, a straight line, and this shape is linear. Now I do want to mention that if you only have two atoms, and you'll see this in your lab, like H2 or HF, if you only have two atoms, that's like connecting two points, and it doesn't matter where the points are, you will get a straight line. So if you only have two atoms, you'll also be linear. Two atoms attached, no lone <coughs> pairs on the central, linear bond angle of 180 degrees. The next shape is going to be bent or angular and in this one, you can have two atoms bonded to the central atom, and you'll either have one or two lone pairs on the central atom. They have different bond angles. This one's a little bit tricky. I'm not going to ask you that one. Um, but the 104.5 is what you would see with water. I'll draw them both for you here. Water we already had drawn. Attached to the oxygen is one, two atoms, two lone pairs. This bond angle is going to be 104.5 degrees. And this structure is bent. 
You also see this, for example, with sulfur dioxide, and this one has a little bit of a weird structure because you're not used to seeing oxygen with one bond and three lone pairs, and I wouldn't recommend that you draw it that way at your level, but it does exist. Um, so I don't love this example for your level, but again, attached to the sulfur are two atoms one lone pair on the sulfur, bond angle of 118 degrees. And again, I don't love this example for you. I'm gonna draw another example a little bit later where you'll see this bent design, but I don't want you to be confused here because for your purposes at the honors level, give oxygen and sulfur two bonds, two lone pairs. You'll be much more successful. The next shape is trigonal planar. The re atoms attached to the central atom, no lone pairs on the central atom, bond angle of 120 degrees. For example, boron, trifluoride, Boron is a little bit unusual. Boron has an incomplete octet. It only forms three bonds, no lone pairs. And the bond angle here, three atoms attached, no lone pairs, is 120 degrees. Be careful with boron, it does not form a complete octet. Three bonds, no lone pairs. And in your bonding chart, that is indicated there, but this is probably the first time you've seen it. You can have a complete octet as well. For example, if you had this one, How many atoms attached to the carbon? Three. How many lone pairs on the carbon? And this bond angle is 120 degrees. And you're going to see all of these images in 3D in the lab, and I'll show you um, a video as well. Tetrahedral, four atoms bonded directly to the central, no lone pairs. The bond angle is 109.5 degrees. An example is methane. And let's take a look at methane. For example, When you draw it, it looks very flat and it looks like the bond angles are 90, but that's actually not the case. When you construct methane, and this will be the beauty of doing the lab today, you can see right here that you don't have 90 degree angles. If you look right here, that angle is clearly larger than 90 degrees, and playing with the kits is fun. More importantly, you really get to see the shapes. It's a huge advantage of using the molecular model kits. In some books, you'll see it drawn more like this, where you can see that angle. This bond is coming towards you, and this bond is going away from you, and the bond angle is 120, uh, not 120, I'm sorry, is 
109.5. Is that legible? Let me fix that so you're not confused. What you also see is tetra is a prefix that means what? Four. Four atoms attached. Tri is a prefix that means three. Three atoms attached. So it's easy to remember at least the beginnings of the names of the different shapes. And in the last shape we want to do, and I will tell you there are a lot more shapes than this in AP. We just covered this and there's like 20. We're going to keep it simple at five this year. Trigonal pyramidal geometry, three atoms attached. There's the tri. One lone pair on the central atom. Bond angle of 107. Let's take a look at our example, ammonia. Nitrogen likes phosphorus, often forms three bonds, one lone pair. This is not drawn to perfection here. You'll see this in the lab, and that'll be 107 degrees. We cover a lot more shapes in advanced chemistry, and we also talk about what causes those difference in bond angles. In your notes, I tried to include a little table for you so you could see linear, trigonal planar, bent or angular, tetrahedral, trigonal pyramidal, and then the other type of bent or angular. So let's take a look. So you're thinking, oh gosh, this is so hard. I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me show you. We'll do this example together, and then you'll try several examples with your partner. Let's say I drew some kooky structure. And right away, you're like, oh gosh, this looks awful. We want to figure out the shape with respect to each central atom. And we'll walk through this one together, and then I'll give you one to try with your partner. My approach is always as follows. I start at the left side, it doesn't really matter where you start, and the N is attached to one, two, three atoms, one lone pair. And that shape would be trigonal, pyramidal. Brian, help me with this one. This carbon is attached to how many? Four is correct. How many lone pairs on the carbon? What's its shape? Absolutely. Excellent. 
All right, right here, volunteer. Go ahead, Haley. Careful, you're looking at Adam's attached, ready? One, two, three, good correction. Lone pairs on the C, none, shape is? You got it. Great job. Good self-correction. All right. This oxygen is attached, Victor, to how many? Two. And how many lone pairs? Two. You got it. Shape is? Two. Two, two is what shape? Bent. Bent is correct. Excellent. Right here, this carbon is attached to how many? Go ahead, Nicole. Two. How many lone pairs on this carbon? Zero. Shape? Um, Perfect. All right, what about this carbon? Go ahead, Andorra. <coughs> um, it's attached to two. Careful, ready? Oh, one, one, two, three. Yes? How many lone pairs on the carbon? Zero. What's its shape? Um, three. Three zero is? Trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. You got it. Good job. And again, this would be the same. One, two, three. What about the S? Who is that? Go ahead, Kyle. Stud. You are correct. So what looked really nasty was pretty easy. I'll give you one to work on with your friend. See if you can do it. Draw it and work on it with your neighbor and see if you've got it. You gotta tell me. How can you read something crooked? And when you draw your structures, when I, I just like draw them, I'm like, we eat it's fun, but make sure you have the right number of bonds. A new pass though, because that one's it, it is easy. It, it, no, we have one more because we have polarity to do, but that's easy too. <laughs>
get back in. Alrighty. Let's see what we've got. What do we have? What do we have? What's the shape? Tetrahedral. What about both of these? What about that one? And what about that one? Bent is correct. And that's what I was saying. The two atoms attached, one lone pair is bent. And it's probably easier to see there than in the example. Pretty easy. Uh, who is that? Kyle. Um, is there a difference between bent and angular? Nah. No. Bent is angular. No. Sort of like if you break your arm and it's just like angular. Some people say V-shaped. But I don't like that one because in advanced chem there's a T shape, so then it gets confusing. All right, I've got a little video clip so you can see some of these different shapes. It'll go into um, expanded octets and I'll probably cut it off there because that'll be a bit much. Those of you interested, I'd be happy to show you separately. Let's take a look. The structure around a center ion is determined principally by minimizing electron pair repulsions. Two bonded electron pairs around the central atom result in a linear structure. Carbon dioxide has a linear structure. <coughs> the bond angle for a linear arrangement is 180 degrees. Three bonding electron pairs around the central atom result in a trigonal planar structure. Boron trifluoride has a trigonal planar structure. The bond angles in a trigonal planar arrangement are 120 degrees. When one of the three electron pairs surrounding the central atom is a non-bonding pair, as in sulfur dioxide, the resulting... A non-bonding pair is a lone pair. That is a synonymous term. The structure is known as bent. Four bonding electron pairs around the central atom result in a tetrahedral structure. Methane has a tetrahedral structure. Tetrahedral arrangement are 109.5 degrees. When one of the four electron pairs surrounding the central atom is a non-bonding pair, as in ammonia, the resulting structure is known as trigonal pyramidal. When two of the four electron pairs surrounding the central atom are non-bonding pairs, as in water, the resulting structure is known as bent. Five. And then there are more types of electron pairs, but again, this is going to expand an octet, and we didn't go there, so I don't want to confuse you. So that's shape or polarity. You have five different shapes, pretty easy to walk through. As you do it today, you'll have that chart memorized by the end of the period, so you don't have to sit there and stare at it till it sinks in. Once you've used it, you'll really know it. The other piece of the puzzle that really helps determine properties of a compound is polarity. And we're going to back up a sec here to make sure you remember something we talked about at the beginning of the chapter. We said, for example, that if you have the same two atoms bonded to each other, that this bond is nonpolar covalent. abbreviated NPC. If the electronegativities are very <coughs> close to one another, for example, in a C to an H bond where the difference is 0.3, when that difference is less than 0.5, this bond is nonpolar covalent as well. When the difference in electronegativity is 0.5 or greater, the bond is 
polar covalent. Any non-metal hooking to fluorine is going to result in a polar covalent bond, abbreviated PC. Since fluorine has an electronegativity greater than that of carbon, carbon is 2.5, and again, these are on the back of your periodic table. We talked about this the other day. Fluorine's more electronegative. So the dipole goes in this direction. The arrow points to the more electronegative atom, the partial negative charge, the partial positive charge. We talked about this very early in the chapter. Do you recall nonpolar covalent versus polar covalent bonds? Okay, good. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to look at whether an entire molecule is polar or nonpolar. And there are some simple rules to apply. It says for molecules containing more than two atoms, molecular polarity depends on bond polarity and shape or orientation. So we're gonna look at the polarity of the bonds as well as the molecular geometry of the molecule. We've got four different scenarios that we're gonna diagram out. The first one says, if all the bonds are nonpolar and there are no lone pairs of electrons on the central atom, the molecule is nonpolar. For example, we'll go back to methane. So this will be example for A. We established previously that a C to H bond is nonpolar covalent. So each of these is nonpolar covalent. There are no lone pairs on the central atom, and therefore this molecule is nonpolar covalent. So all nonpolar bonds, no lone pairs on a central atom, you have a nonpolar covalent molecule. The second one says, if only one bond is polar, the molecule is polar. For example, methyl, fluoride. We know the C to H bond is nonpolar covalent. A C to F bond will be polar covalent. Any nonmetal hooking to fluorine will have a polar covalent bond. So you've got a dipole going in this direction right here off this bond. There's nothing to balance the dipole out, and so a single polar bond will result in a polar covalent molecule. So this molecule is polar covalent. Now, if I had two polar bonds here and two nonpolar, it would still be polar. C says, the presence of a single lone pair of electrons on the central atom results in a polar molecule. 
For example, ammonia. Now in terms of an N to H bond, you've got 3.0, you've got 2.2 is 0 0.8. So this bond is polar covalent. In addition, the presence of a single lone pair on a central atom and the molecule will be polar covalent. So ammonia is polar covalent. So let's think about the two shapes that have lone pairs on their central atom. One is trigonal pyramidal. What shape has two atoms attached to lone pairs? Bent is correct, and let's think about water. An O to H bond is also polar covalent, and you have two lone pairs on the central atom. Water, you know from biology as well as science from middle school is polar covalent. Water's polar covalent. That's why you can't just use water to clean oil off something. Oil is nonpolar. For your purposes, if within the structure you have trigonal pyramidal or bent geometry, your molecule overall will be polar covalent. So for example, in this structure that you worked on with your friend, you've got bent right here, and right away you know that this structure, this molecule, is polar covalent. So the presence of bent or trigonal pyramidal in a molecule indicates polar covalent compound. The last one's a little bit tricky, <coughs> but I think you'll see it. The last rule of the day, and then you'll be able to construct these and get a better look see. It says if all the bonds are polar, examine the symmetry. If the molecule is perfectly symmetrical, has no lone pairs on the central atom, that's why it's symmetrical as well, and all atoms bonded to the central atom are the same or have similar electronegativities, the molecule is nonpolar because the dipoles cancel. The most common example that you would see would be carbon tetrafluoride, and you'll learn how to name these. We have established that a C to F bond is polar covalent. However, what happens here is that the dipoles all pull in equal but opposite directions. And as a result, the molecule is nonpolar covalent because the dipoles cancel in this 
Thank you. The dipoles cancel in this symmetrical. molecules. And when I think about this, I think maybe you have, let's say, a suspect in some crime who's been incredibly unruly, and maybe they tased him safely. He's lying on the ground on his back and his arms are out and his legs are out and four police officers need to come now and move him. Each police officer takes a limb, so one arm, one arm, one leg, one leg, but they don't figure out which way they want to go and they all walk in opposite directions. If the police officers are all of the same build and they all pull in equal but opposite directions, nobody goes anywhere because it just cancels itself out. And that's how I like to think about that. Please don't try this. And the kids are like, well, you're going to pull his limbs out. It's just a visual cancellation of dipoles due to perfect symmetry. You can't have perfect symmetry when you have trigonal pyramidal or bent. And so these are asymmetric structures that will always be polar covalent. In a tetrahedral molecule, you can have perfect symmetry. You can also have it in a linear molecule. So another really good example would be carbon dioxide where the C to O bonds are polar covalent. <coughs> but the dipoles are working in equal but opposite directions so they cancel as well. And carbon dioxide even though it has polar bonds, is a nonpolar covalent molecule because of its perfect symmetry, the dipoles cancel. And these two examples, as well as these two, are always the ones that are most commonly asked. And you will see them or something very close to them in your lab as well. So you should be able to really do nicely there. So your lesson today on polarity and shape helps to explain properties of compounds as I indicated the other day. Glucose and fructose have the same molecular formula but different structural formulas. Somebody who is diabetic can't tolerate much glucose but they can tolerate fructose much better simply because the structure is different. So shape is very important, as is polarity in determining properties of molecules. And you'll see the polarity concept in regard to why some substances dissolve in water where others don't. Remember for your lab that water is a polar covalent molecule, oil is not. And that'll help you there. Questions on anything we've done? You need more examples? You ready to rock? All right, really good job, and we are going to get into the lab today.